A pleasant Tuesday, everyone. Welcome into the It's Official Podcast. I'm Jeremy Plunk from First Bet and Express Bet. He's Jeff Siegel. Each and every week, we take on five hot topics in horse racing. And Jeff, most of the time, it's on the track. We get to talk about somebody like us this week. It's the National <laughs> Horse Players Championship was completed this past weekend in Las Vegas. So we're going to give the horse players a shout out this week. And to me, that's near and dear. Oh, for sure. I mean, I don't participate in these contests for various reasons, one of which I don't really have time. You know? But um, And I probably wouldn't do all that well. I'm, in fact, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't. And if you've got 700 and some odd people who are in the contest, odds are stacked against you. But if you win it, yes. as Mike Gillum did, then that's a, that's a hit of a lifetime. And uh, I can't imagine... Uh, going down to the last uh, race and being in front by a, a dollar or two. And, um, you know, with how, oh, so much on the line, yeah. uh, tension must have been great. But it's exciting to see. And we congratulate the, the handicapper who was able to pull it off. You've sweated out some pick sixes over the years where you knew the will pay. So what do you do when there's big money on the line, Jeff Siegel? You're looking at six, seven figures potentially on a payout. You're in the last leg. Are you like walking around? Are you going to the bathroom? I mean, what are you doing? If, oh, you're, if you're pacing. You're, sitting there. you're pacing. You're pacing. And <laughs> the, the, the conversations, when we, we hit for 700000 at Santa Anita back in the 80s, we didn't know it was that much because they didn't have the – will pays at the time he just had okay. to work it out um but we were thinking about that and we were the, you know the conversation went to where we where do we want the horse to be you know who can who you're afraid of how is the jock gonna screw it up you know all, all this <laughs> things. and it was and then he won at the, the last race he won so we knew we hit it we yeah. uh, we thought there was a chance we might have the whole pool which would have been 1.4 million dollars mm-hmm. but uh I don't know. That was like 40 years ago. I can't even remember yesterday. So, I mean, I think it was fun. <laughs> I think. Whatever your lucky spot is at the track, you're finding it, right? And if oh, somebody's yeah, in sure. that spot, you're giving them a little nudge. Like, oh, sorry, buddy, I got to stand here uh, when that kind of money's on the line. Let's get after our five topics this week as Louisiana Derby Week hits us here. And the Triple Crown Trail really picks up pace this coming weekend. Our first topic, we are going to hail the champ. Mike Gillum is his name from Indianapolis, Indiana. The winner of the 25th National Horse Players Championship in Las Vegas this past weekend. He qualified through the uh, tournament on track at Horseshoe Indianapolis, his home racetrack, and went on to the victory. It wasn't easy. He started day three of the tournament in 64th place. He had no cap horses, nothing crazy. He just picked winner after winner after winner after winner and finally caught that guy on the right. What a tournament played by Seth Morris. He led for almost a day and a half over 700 plus players before being caught in the next to last race. Gillum took the lead in the next to last contest race with a favorite that put him a dollar 20 ahead and it gave him a chance to close out the tournament by taking the favorite in the last race at Santa Anita who delivered the big money for him. How much money? You see the check, $800,000. The final table at the NHC shaked out this way with these 10 players. Mike Gillum got the $800,000 payday. Seth Morris led almost all the way, still quarter million dollars in his pocket. What a great tournament he played, but a $550,000 loss. He'll be thinking about, I'm sure, in that last race at Santa Anita. Top 10 rounded out by Matthew Blanchett, Lawrence Calden, Daniel Kaplan, Rob Henney, Nicholas Sharilla, TJ Sunday, GT Nixon, and Scott Cavalieri, all the way down to 10th, paying out 65000 in the final table. Jeff and I are going to talk about some of the do's and don'ts and things that, uh, that, that struck us about this year's NHC in just a minute. But you want to hear from the winner and Rachel McLaughlin from Horseshoe Indianapolis. She was part of the home team, I guess. She was working for the NHC this weekend doing player interviews. She caught up with Mike Gillum just moments after the big finale. Mike, I'm tickled to death for you. Tell me how you're feeling first and foremost. Absolutely incredible. The, it, it's just like tops. It's like way tops after the kids being born and getting married and all the good stuff. You know, grandbaby. Um, this is just, uh, it's, it's, it's a great day. Uh, yeah, I'm, I know uh, I'll probably never get here or do this again. well i'll get here again i don't know about win it but uh, it's so hard to win um i'm just it's my third year being here uh last year i came and i qualified came in 34th um so i cashed and i was really happy about that but to come here and now actually win it is just absolutely so excited and i almost screwed it up <laughs> 
I was fifth after day one, and on, with two races to go, I was in 81st. So I'm like, how can you possibly not qualify after being in fifth? It all just worked out. I, I, I barely made it to the second day. I barely made it to the final table on the very last race. And then I barely held, I mean, I got to it. You know, first with two races to go, and I barely held, you know, you know, you know, barely held on with a, a favor. So I'm just so excited. I can't believe this is really happening. I keep wanting to pinch myself, and uh, I do. And I'm like, ow, oh, that hurts. So I guess it is true. It was true indeed. And that's the sound of a guy hitting for $800,000. I'd be screaming too. I, I'm one of those people who scream, and I'm like, you know, riding along with the jock at the track. I mean, you know, some people don't like the fans who do it that way and rather you act like you've been there before. I get excited when I'm hitting a winner. So if it's of any significance at all, uh, you'll hear me, but not like Mike that day uh, when he took down $800,000. You know, just a regular horse player, Jeff, and this is what I like. He picks up the racing form. He's been reading the racing form every day of 20, 30 years, playing the races, passed down from his grandfather to his father, his uncle, he said, uh, play in, in Indianapolis and uh, grew up playing the races, doesn't use any fancy dancy, you know, computer programs or anything like that. And he did this almost like a pick and pray, he said, where he made his selections ahead of time and stuck with them. He wasn't playing the tote. He wasn't playing the game or the system. He just had damn good handicapping. And that's the thing is I, I know that I, this, I used to think that there's a lot of luck involved in this. And of course there is, we know that, mm. but you still have to be able to handicap. And for him to uh, do so well in, in a previous tournament and then win this one tells me, this guy can can pick winners, and he can yeah. play it the, the right way. It's not luck. It's luck, obviously, there's a great component, but you still have to have the skill. And uh, I see a lot of names that are, you know, in the top 20, 30, uh, like every year. I mean, they don't always mm -hmm. win, but they get paid, and they do a mm -hmm. good job. So it's not luck. It's it's uh, it's it's skill. And, and this, you know, um, this man, uh, Mike Gillum, um, he's got skill. We know that. <laughs> He's got game and he's got $800,000 now. If you enjoy the tournament scene, be sure to play with Express Bet and First Bet. Uh, Express Bet Online has the best tournament play that you'll find anywhere. 100% of entry fees go back into the payoffs. Uh, Express Bet keeps no money when they play uh, tournaments tournaments online with uh, with our program. So be sure to get involved. Go to expressbet.com slash tournaments or click on the navigation bar there with the tournaments tag, and that'll get you to the uh, schedule and how you enroll in the tournaments with Expressbet because great way to play. A lot of people take a big interest in it. And uh, I know with the NHC, the players who are serious about it, you know, they don't necessarily like to take out of the tournament that the NTRA takes uh, a lot of operational fees out of it and not a hundred percent of it's paid back. But again, when you get to the top, that $800,000 payday is, is something exceptional. And that's why so many people chase it each and every year because it can be a life changing score. But again, when you play with express bet and first bet online tournaments at express bet, there is no takeout in those tournaments, all the money paid back each and every tournament uh, in the form of cash and prizes. So check those out. Uh, if you want to get involved in the tournament scene. Up next, topic two on the big board. We go from Mike Gillum's championship victory to the best sprinter in California. The cow bread, the chosen Braun, was at it again this past weekend. Yeah, we know he dominates the cow breads, but he steps into open company on occasion as well and flexes his muscle. He did so in winning the San Carlos. The chosen Braun turns for home, well off the rail. Ghost of Midnight takes up the chase on the inside of Elwood Blues. There's an eighth of a mile to go, and the chosen and Braun still loaded, cruising through the stretch. Ghost of Midnight running a big race along the inside as they pass the 16th pole. The chosen Braun is simply too strong as he wins the San Carlos Stakes. I'll leave it to you, Jeff, one of the coolest horses in your backyard. No question. Uh, he has now won 16 races from 21 career starts. Although he made most of his uh, uh, money uh, facing Calbreds, uh, he's a grade one winner. He won the Ben Crosby last year. This was a San Carlos, a grade two. Uh, there is just nobody around that can touch him locally. Now, if you're going to throw in Elite Power and those kind of horses at right. him, like you saw in the Breeders' Cup, all right, that's real tough. Uh, but other than that, and uh, I don't know if there is any uh, top quality sprinters of that level this year. I know that Joseph mm -hmm. Braun can run at Del Mar. I'm sure that they would right. like to try him again at the Breeders' Cup and keep him healthy. But one thing I will say, uh, Eric Krulljack has done such a great job because 
He's never asked the chosen Ron, other than in the Breeders' Cup, which was his own backyard. I doubt if he would have traveled for that race. But other than that yeah. race, Tananita, he's never asked the chosen Ron to really do more than he's capable of doing. And what he's capable of doing is beating just about everybody. That's and that's sprinting, routing, dirt, grass. It doesn't matter. Uh, I actually think he's just as effective two turns. In fact, if you go back and look at his chart, you'd see the last two-turn race he, he, he had. He won by six and a half. Uh, going a mile uh, around two turns. So he can do just about anything. And the idea here with the gelding is to keep him going as for as long as possible and to maintain your form as long, as long as possible. And that's what the chosen Ron has done. Interesting story about Ghost of Midnight who ran second and probably ran as well against the chosen Ron as anybody. Um, mm -hmm. Here's a horse who didn't run until uh, he was uh, uh, five years old. He was maiden 20. <laughs> he didn't run. Uh, he made his debut. And he trained like a stakes horse, like a derby horse, way back as a three-year-old. Never made it to the post. Finally made it back. Or finally made it to the races at age five and a maiden 20 at Del Mar last year. Uh, and this is a horse that, uh, by Ghost Sapper, I mean, he was eight to one the day that he won his maiden. And I remember him. I'm saying, I don't know if this horse is like broken down or whatever, but right. he was a good horse at one time. He had slow works. But anyway, he won that race from here to there. And since then... He's risen from a maiden 20 all the way up to a grade two sprinter. Ghost of Midnight is just a neat horse, and that's who the chosen Ron had to beat. These two horses are one of my favorites on the grounds because they've overcome adversity and just mm -hmm. laid on the line every time they run. I love the older sprinters. It's just mm -hmm. Americana. It's just blue-collar racing, but at a higher level. You know, the, the highest of the blue-collar level when you get these top-notch mm -hmm. older sprinters like that, and they are the backbone of the game to me. And and the horses that you want to come out and see five, six, yeah. seven, eight times a year uh, when they race. So uh, just another great performance by the Chosen Fran as he continues his winning streak now and winning 10 of his last 11. To our third topic this week, we're going to go to the Triple Crown Tracker. Uh, we don't have any big race to review last week it was all quiet on the three-year-old prep front in a rarity but we had a couple big workouts to talk about jeff and also a big news item we hinted about this a week ago at this time in the triple crown tracker where we said where the heck is nisos we've been looking for him for a couple weeks where there was smoke there was fire he was ended up uh, i think just a couple hours after our podcast dropped on uh, tuesday a week ago they announced that nisos is going to be out now for the next 30 days with a with a minor setback uh, according to the connections so looks like santanita derby obviously would be off the table at that point and the preakness looks to be in major jeopardy uh, if he misses 30 days he won't make the preakness no i mean you could just put two plus two together there i mean he for him not to for him to get scratched, not work that weekend, mm -hmm. not work the following weekend, and now we're right. getting into the next weekend. And we speculated that if, if he doesn't work in a day or two, there's something on this. Obviously, there was. I don't know exactly what it is. Um, they didn't really specify as to what the issue was. Right. 30 days means you know what it, sometimes the 30 days means it means we don't know what's wrong with them, but we'll check them back in 30 days and see if something's right. serious with that. That's what it could be. It, it could be bone bruising. It could be a lot of things. But in the, what what I definitely think is it's it puts uh, it puts not only the San Diego Derby, which is obviously not going to happen, but even the Preakness, it puts it puts that race in jeopardy because he's not only is he not trained, but you don't you just don't start breezing him in thirty days. You know you got to right. help him and get him fit again and make sure that he's okay. So I, mm -hmm. I'd say that's off the off the, uh, the the planning as well. So that's too bad. But it just goes to show you how tough it is. And can you imagine owning that horse and being eligible to the Kentucky Derby? And forget about, well, he wasn't going to run the Derby anyway, so what's the difference? Right. But, but uh, man, it's tough. I mean, to have oh. a Derby horse, you just it, – it's the racing gods are cruel sometimes. And um, Everything I, has to go your way, right? And we talked about this with Locke a couple yeah. weeks ago, too. That yeah. he the same boat where things were not going right you know he had a temperature he missed a start that he missed another start just just pull the plug at that point and it ends up lock had a knee injury i believe uh yeah. was reported and and would be out for a while as well so yeah like you know we talked with nisos at the beginning of the year when the churchill downs date shift happened you know when they said horses had to leave the barn by the end of january i think it was yeah. 
before Triple Crown nominations came out and all that. And we talked about, oh, what a crime it could be to Nisos in, in public opinion of, look, this could be the Derby winner and he's not even going to be eligible. But we cautioned at the time, look, hey, it's a long way between now and the Derby. He could be justified or he could be mastery, right? And a horse mm -hmm. like that for Baffert who wins one or two starts just absolutely brilliantly, maybe a third start. And then you don't see him again. I mean, it happens, right? We see brilliant horses go by the wayside and never make it to the Triple Crown. Right now, Nysos is looking more mastery, perhaps, than uh, Justify, uh, but certainly a horse who was very exciting uh, on the early part of the trail this winter. And now Nysos, of course, looks like he will not be part of the Kentucky Derby. Obviously, we knew that, but now probably not part of the Preakness as well. We'll cross our fingers and see where we might see him again. Now, we did have some big horses working this past week. In fact, two of the top horses in the country. Sierra Leone is considered by many the number one ranked horse off his win in the Risen Star. He's not running back this weekend in the Louisiana Derby. We'll see him next in the Bluegrass at Keeneland in a couple weeks, but he's been training down in Florida, Jeff, and he had himself quite an interesting tag team partner back here on the 16th on Saturday. That's a colt named Blazing Sevens. You may recall, and uh, he's on the outside here. You may recall Blazing Sevens uh, finishing second in the Preakness last year. So right. not only is this an older horse, but he is a very, very good old horse on the comeback trail. Have not seen Blazing se Sevens uh, since last summer, but he looks like he's training really well. Now, Sierra Leone's on the inside here, Jeremy, and it's not his running style. He, I would have thought they would have broken him off behind blazing the saddles. But the fact that he was on the inside and maintained his position, uh, mild coaxing only, um, that to me was an impressive drill. I know you're a fan of the movie, but I remember this from last year. You've called Blazing Sevens Blazing Saddles a couple of times now on the podcast, Jeff. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Dude, blazing Freudian Saddles. Flip. I mean, it's a great Blazing movie. Saddles to me. I mean, I mean uh, – <laughs> I remember when that movie came out, and that was 1972, and it was so unique. It, it, it had so many things in it that had never been on screen before. If you watched it now, you'd probably say, well, that's old hat. But at the time, <laughs> Facing Saddles was pretty darn funny. Anyway, I like that work, Jeremy. Didn't you? I mean, uh, inside yeah, I did. and into the bridle, not being asked, not too fast, not too slow, uh, but what was needed to kick him over for his next start. And I think he is the horse to beat now in the Derby based on all I've seen so far. Things could right. change, but right now, Sierra Leone is my top pick. And you have to know your trainers and how they work horses. Chad Brown's going to work them even like that. Finish heads up. There's not one defeating the other kind of situation. That's the way Chad works. But I thought it's everything you wanted to see from Sierra Leone. He looks to have come out of that risen start and should be formidable for sure uh, in the bluegrass stakes. Now, Fierceness was defeated in his first start after winning the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. He came back in the Holy Bull at Gulfstream a month or so ago and just was flat that day. He's been working in company with a horse, Tuscan Sky, who was a really hot shot horse from the Gulfstream meet. Won a maiden, won an allowance. Looks like a stakes horse that Todd's going to put in one of these final preps to give a shot. They worked together in company two Tuscan weeks ago. Tuscan Gold has a neck to make up on Skip the Line. Back to the fierceness and Tuscan Sky workout here uh, from Palm Beach Downs on last Friday, the 15th of March. These two have worked in company now two weeks in a row. And Tuscan Sky, the gray to the outside, fierceness to the inside. Tuscan Sky's got to work hard to try to keep up, and he really doesn't. And you see fierceness going much easier, the two. You know, fierceness might be the University of Arizona version of horses. In other words, they can he can look great when they win, but he can lose to anybody. And I think that's right. what U of A is going to have to worry about come tournament time. But the problem with, with fierceness is not ability. It's not, ah, yeah. oh, is he good enough? No, that's not the issue. The issue is, will he bring his best race in a race with a big field in which he doesn't figure to get a pristine type of trip? When you're working inside here and you got nobody in front of you and nobody to the left of you, nobody behind you, you're going to look good because this mm -hmm. coach, as he showed in the Breeders' Cup, has a tremendous amount of talent. And uh, if you could tell me what kind of trip he's going to get in his next start and in the Kentucky Derby, I could tell you whether he's going to win or not. Right. I think Florida Derby next for fierceness. I think they're going to want him to be up into the race. You know, I think that's kind of working him inside like that. And, uh, you know, instead of breaking off and behind and they're not trying to it doesn't seem like they're trying to teach him anything. Right. I think they're letting mm -hmm. him be him. And, right. and if that's good enough, it's good enough. And like you said, he doesn't want a lot of negatives. So, 
he's got to get out of the gate. He's got to get into the mix. We'll see what kind of field shows up for the Florida Derby and, and talk about some of these three-year-olds and, and where they may head next. Here on the uh, Triple Crown Tracker, we're going to take a look at my countdown to the Crown Top 20. This week, no major changes if you saw the Friday publication of this because we already had Nisos out of the mix last Friday. But on Tuesday's podcast, we showed you where Nisos was ranked number two last week. Now Nisos is out. The horse I brought up into the rankings is Encino. He was really impressive for Brad Cox and Godolphin in running down the favorite to win the Mike Battaglia or the John Battaglia uh, stakes at Turfway Park. And Encino doesn't run back this weekend in the Jeff Ruby because that race was only three weeks in front of the main event at Turfway. So we're going to see Encino again, probably in the bluegrass or wood. We added the potential prep races here to the top 20 horses. Uh, these are a combination of uh, reported uh, uh, goals and targets from the trainers. Also a little bit of speculation. There's some either ors in there, but uh, Jeff, as you take a look at the top 20 here, again, no major changes to, to the order and the way I think uh, the way I shake things out here, but uh, you see a lot of the top horses will not be matching up with each other uh, in that final prep. And a lot of them are going to try to zig and zag away from each other. Yeah. That's kind of interesting because that'll make the Derby even more challenging. The more, uh, head to heads you don't have, the more likely mm -hmm. you will have of really having to dig down deep and find the best horse that you know hasn't been determined quite yet. Um, we're still waiting. The two that I'm kind of waiting for uh, are Conquest Warrior, who I really think is a good colt. Uh, mm -hmm. You got a number 11, which is about as high as you could put him, uh, based on the fact that he's never been in a stakes race yet. Right. And then, and then um, Mystic Dan, who was so impressive in an off track win. I don't know whether it was the mud or not. More times than not, when I see a horse like that, it turns out that it was the mud and that they're not that good, you know. So, but I, I'm not going to condemn Mystic Dan until such time as he proves that he's just a mud freak and nothing else. So, those are the two that I'm kind of really interested in that, that could leapfrog into your top 10 uh, right. next time out. And uh, the rest of these, I'm pretty sure I, I have a pretty good feeling as to what they're capable of doing. But, and then again, Forever Young. Uh, over in Dubai. I mean, we don't know what he's quite right. up to, and he'll be interested. We'll be interested to see how he runs uh, overseas because if he wins, he's coming over, and uh, they, he's good. I know that. He's right. at least good, and he may be better than good, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how he runs there. There are questions, right? I mean, fierceness, is he going to bounce back from that race? Is Forever Young as good as we think? He didn't dominate in Saudi Arabia. Is he going to show more in the UAE, as you question? Sierra Leone just does kind of tick the box. You know, yeah. I mean, he ran really well in the Remsen last year, which has proven to be a key race this spring. He came back with a nice victory. Same with Doorknock. He came back and got the victory, but he wasn't a wow performance. But you kind of think with Doorknock and Sierra Leone, you know what you've got there. Now it's just a matter of like somebody else is better than them, but they seem to be who they are, you know, and, and, and they seem trustworthy. Same way I thought the comeback race was good for Timberlake at Oaklawn uh, when he came back in the Rebel Stakes. Uh, we'll see him in his final prep, but... A lot of these others kind of have some question marks yet to uh, solve and answer. Others, we don't know quite what their ceiling is, but that's what we're going to determine between now and Derby Day. Again, I think we're inside like around 50 days to the Kentucky Derby, something like that around this point. And it seems like a long ways off, but these horses basically have one more start, and then it's the training up to the Kentucky Derby uh, from that point forward. Back to the big board, and we're going to stay with the theme of the Kentucky Derby chase and the road to the Triple Crown because we've got two prep races races this week. And we're going to take a chance here to preview a bit. Uh, two races this week are the Fairgrounds race, the Louisiana Derby, and the Turfway race, the Jeff Ruby. Jeff Siegel, let's start our preview of the Louisiana Derby, taking a look at this field of 12 morning line favorites, Track Phantom on the outside. He's running in all four legs of the Louisiana Derby series. He's the only horse to be appearing more than two of them, and he draws the 12 hole again. This is custom for Track Phantom. He's been the outside horse in all four races except one where he was next to the outside. He's only had one horse outside of him in four races this season. That might be a good thing, though, for a horse who's got some early speed like he is being outside of the other speeds. But can he stop? That's the thing. I, I, I mean, sure, if he can cross over and get over and going a mile and three sixteenths, there should not be any issue in doing that. So I don't think the outside post bothers him at all. Here's what I looked at, though, Jeremy. I when I'm trying to evaluate one of the tools that I use, not the only one by any stretch, but one mm -hmm. of the tools I, I, uh, I use 
is trying to figure out whether this th- a three-year-old is making progress. Is he getting mm-hmm. better with every race? Is he advancing? Is he stepping up? Here's Track Phantom's last four buyer numbers, um, beginning with the maiden win at Churchill Downs, November 25th. He's gone from 88 to 89 to 90, back to 89. Mm-hmm. So he's had four races, and he's just kind of like staying in the same spot. Right. Okay. And I don't know how much upside he has. Not only that, but his last two races, he got those that front-running, controlling speed type of race, which you right. can never count on in any race uh, at this level and then in the Kentucky Derby. So I'm a little soft on track phantom. Now, you compare this with a horse like Tuscan Gold, okay? And uh, Tuscan Gold is 8-1. to one. Now, as a gambler, I'm looking not so much what Tuscan Gold has done but what I think he might be capable of doing in what would right. be just his third career start. First time out, he earned a uh, modest 65 buyer number at Aqueduct Sprinting, and then he jumped all a- a- ahead in a two-turn race at Gulfstream to an 84. So he m- moved up 19 points from between his maiden win, uh, maiden race, first race, and his maiden mm-hmm. win. I think that's what the pattern that I would like to see, especially for right. Chad Brown, Hope by Medaglia Oro, out of a mirror by Curlin. They're not mm-hmm. supposed to be precocious with that kind of pedigree. Right. So to me, whatever he's done, and he's done, he's already right there with these anyway. I think you're going to see a rather significant jump up from Tuscan Gold. To me, he might be the gamble in that race. I agree. I think he had a really troubled trip in that race in his career debut that he wasn't supposed to win. Sierra mm-hmm. Leone won that race. He was the other Chad Brown in there. Change of command was in there. A really good show course. One mm-hmm. of the better mate races in New York last year, and he had a ton of trouble with it. So much so that that debut fourth place finish, I ranked him in my top 20 in the preseason to start the year as a derby mm-hmm. contender off a fourth place maiden race. He hadn't broken his maiden yet. I think he's the goods and I thought his race and his comeback at Gulfstream was really good. Tuscan Gold has a neck to make up on Skip the Line and here he comes now. Gaffleone and Tuscan Gold issue the challenge through three quarters in 113 and one. It's Tuscan Gold who's powered forward to take the lead. Skip the Line is flat to the boards but back to second, seven ahead of the rest, led by Big Rich and Princetown. Final 16th to go. They go to the first wire and Tuscan Gold's going to get there first. It's it's Tuscan Cold clearing off for trainer Chad Brown to win by five. So who did he beat? The horse who ran second in that race was a brother to arrogate for Todd Pletcher, who was supposed to be the goods, and he put him away by five legs. So I'm thinking Tuscan Gold might be the horse to beat in the Louisiana Derby. Jeff and I will have all of our final handicapping on the Friday podcast, First Call, so be sure to check back for that. Also this weekend in the Triple Crown Trail, we've got the Jeff Ruby coming up on Saturday at Turfway Park. A mile and an eighth on the Tapita surface, a field of 12 with a couple also eligible to the outside. Agate Road is cross-centered in both races, the Louisiana Derby, and this race at Turfway, the Jeff Ruby. He's been really good on turf. Uh, He's a horse who maybe would fit better, I think, in the Jeff Ruby than he would in the Louisiana Derby. We'll see where Todd Pletcher turns with him. He's the four-to-one second choice in the Jeff Ruby. But Jeff, the favorite, is Endlessly, who's won all over California from Del Mar to Santa Anita to Golden Gate Fields. Uh, He is the top horse on turf in Southern California and on synthetic in Northern California. What do you make of Endlessly coming into the Jeff Ruby. I like him a lot. I, I think he's in a really nice colt. He was running on grass uh, last year as a two-year-old, which would make sense being by Oscar performance. And he's never been on dirt and he won't have to worry about dirt until maybe the Kentucky Derby because this race obviously on the all weather. I thought his win in the El Camino Real Derby at Golden Gate was very good. I liked the way he finished. He, he came home strongly. Um, and uh, the, the two colts that he beat, uh, Tapalo, uh, and uh, a guy named Joe, they're they're better than average. I can tell you that. Mm-hmm. In fact, the guy named Joe ran well in a, in a turf stakes at Santa Anita just last weekend. And mm-hmm. I mean, he went by them and and did it the right way. And uh, I, I think Mike McCarthy, Michael McCarthy, is a terrific trainer, and Rispoli right. knows him. He's going to go back and ride him, and he's already proven he can go a mile and eight. So I like endlessly. I, I really think under these conditions, all weather at this distance, improving pattern career top number in his last start, I think endlessly is going to win this race. 
And with Epic Ride and also Encino, the one two finishers in the Bataglia Memorial, the top two horses on the grounds at Turfway not coming back. This is a race where they're all trying to get used to the footing. Only one horse in the Jeff Ruby field has ever raced at Turfway. So they're all new shooters trying to figure out the footing. And Tapita was no problem in Northern California for endlessly last time has a lead by about three lengths. Endlessly, the chalk comes on the outside and endlessly has a sixteenth of a mile to make up two lengths. And it's Tapala with the lead close to home, but it's endlessly, endlessly, the favor sweeps on by for the win. Tapalo second, guy named Joe third, Old Triangle fourth. And for our final picks on this race and many others for the weekend, our stakes, be sure to check out the Friday podcast. Again, first call it usually drops in the early afternoon hours. Jeff and I will handicap not only the Jeff Ruby, but we'll look at the Louisiana Derby as well. And that uh, Bluegrass Bayou Pick 5. We're going to look at all five races in that Pick 5 sequence. Okay, Jeff, we're going to finish up with our Stars of Tomorrow segment. This is what we do here on the show on It's Official. We've been doing about a year and a half where we give you one for the road, something optimistic to look forward to. And our Stars of Tomorrow this week goes back to Oak Lawn Park, where this is Uscar made an impressive debut. We're going to listen to Matt Ditterman's call, and you can tell us all about this new rising star. Top of the lane, this is Uskar off the turn, has the lead here. Capital Connection second, Burlesworth third, Duke of Duval is next as they hit the furlong pole. This is Uskar is still ahead and he's opening up now and the son of Oscar performance putting on a show today in the first career race. He's made a very good impression. This is Uskar draws off one by five. Big win there at Oakland. What do you make of this one? Well, on the Oscar performance theme that will continue here, first time starter sprinting over a wet track. I mean, you wouldn't expect to see the, this Colt's best stuff sprinting right. over a wet track. He was nine to one. I probably didn't do a whole lot with him in the morning, just kind of literally getting his feet wet in this race. <laughs> and yet he showed very good speed, head and head, drew off. His best work was done in the final 16th of a mile, last eighth and 12 and one, uh, not knocked about, galloped out well. And to me, when you get an Oscar performance three-year-old Colt winning first time out sprinting and doing it stylishly, right. you have to think that the, the best is yet to come. Mm -hmm. He's out of a mare by Good Journey, who was a California uh, stallion, uh, and the mare herself, uh, multiple stakes placed. She was a full sister to Bella Viaggio, who was a terrific mm -hmm. cowbred mare. The family yeah. is there, third damn stakes winning daughter of prize. So there's nothing but stamina on the bottom yeah. side of the battery and quality. And so for this Colt to win first time out, uh, in that way, I, I don't know how ambitious they're going to get, um, but um, whatever it is, uh, he certainly looks like uh, if I owned him, I'd really be excited about him. But I'd also want to take it easy just a little bit. Let, no, let's not get crazy. Let's just right. go through the conditions and then eventually uh, the chance will be there uh, to do whatever you want with them. Whether keep them on dirt, run them on grass, run them long, whatever it is, you can do it. This is Uskar is the name of the horse, and I, I would definitely keep your eyes out when this cold comes back uh, down the road. Our five topics on the board this week are now official because Jeff Siegel and I said so. We said hail to the champ, Mike Gillum. Congratulations on the $800,000 victory in the National Horse Players Championship. The chosen Vron, he just does it. He's on the clock and he's in the winner's circle. Ten of his last 11 now after winning the San Carlos. Our Triple Crown tracker looked at some workouts from Fierceness and also, Sierra Leone, we talked about the defection of Nisos from the trail, and he's out 30 days now. We previewed the preps at Fairgrounds and Turfway Park for the Louisiana Derby and the Jeff Ruby. And then we took a look at our star of tomorrow, that being this is Uskar, winning at Oaklawn Park over the past week. Okay, Jeff, it's March Madness as we get set here on, what, Tuesday morning for our podcast. we got play-in games coming on. We've got uh, brackets. we got brackets to be busted at this point, but we can be perfect right now because nothing is uh, crossed off on our sheet at this point. So I know uh, it was not the college basketball season. Neither you nor I won it. Uh, your Bruins, my Sooners, both left out of the tournament. Uh, and we're going to be looking at this strictly from a uh, – handicapper standpoint i guess <laughs> when we look at march madness this year who do you like in the big dance well this is when i tell you that i absolutely have no clue even though i watch as much <laughs> basketball as anybody because so, so many games uh are inexplainable in terms of the results um 
I know I mentioned earlier, I know Arizona on their very best day, mm-hmm. uh, they're the fierceness of uh, college basketball. Right. They can look great. They can blow anybody out at any time, but they can also lose to anybody, as they mm-hmm. did last year up in Sacramento when I was there uh, to see the Bruins and Arizona was there as well. They lost to, what was it, Princeton, I think? Mm-hmm. But anyway, the p- bottom line is um, these kinds of things will happen. I wouldn't be surprised if there was a, a just a crazy team. Uh, it's easy to pick. UConn and, and figure that they're, they've been there. They know how to win. Um, so, you know, if I gun to my head, I would pick UConn, Chalk City, right? right. Um, but, you know, Arizona to me is um, capable and on their mm-hmm. best day. I don't know whether they can play six good games in a row, but I've seen them play uh, uh, in person. I've seen them play on TV. And when they're hot, they are really good. So we'll see what, see what happens with them. I'm not a big Arizona fan, but uh, – I think they have a chance at a price. Let's put it that way. (laughs) I'm not a big 12 homer. I typically root against the big 12 teams (laughs) because you're recruiting against them, you know, as Oklahoma, I don't want to see them have success, but we're leaving the big 12 now and going to the sec. So the big 12 teams can go on and win now. And and I won't have a hang up over it, but I do think Iowa state's got a big chance, but Mm -hmm. they're in the same bracket with, uh, with Connecticut. So that elite yeah. eight potential matchup between the one and two seeds in the East with Connecticut and Iowa state, that could be the national championship uh, precursor. The winner of that game might be on the fast track to winning the title. I really like Iowa state uh, uh, out of the big 12 to make a lot of noise in the dance. Uh, they've had a phenomenal season and they play the game the right way. They can score and they defend like crazy. So uh, really a good team there. That's our thoughts on college basketball. They're not nearly as uh, in-depth, probably, as some of you out there. So uh, we hope that uh, you have fun with your brackets, even if you're just one who fills it out in an office pool and has a little fun uh, online. Uh, enjoy the games. Enjoy the horse racing. We've got a big prep weekend. We talked about the two big preps in Louisiana and uh, also at Turfway. There's also two other three-year-old races to keep your eye on. At Oakland, they're running the Hot Spring Stakes, which is a mile. Nash is in that one, a horse who's dropped out of some major stakes. That could get you back maybe towards a Lexington move, Preakness move. So that Oakland Hot Spring Stakes on Saturday could have some Preakness horses in it. Keep an eye on that. Mm-hmm. And also with the Preakness path, they've got the two-turn private term stakes for hundred grand running at Laurel on Saturday. Uh, those races tend to produce horses towards the Federico Tessio, and then they would springboard into potentially the Preakness. So could have a couple Preakness starters off the main path with those two major preps, uh, but we're going to focus obviously on Louisiana and Kentucky this weekend uh, with those two big three-year-old preps. Uh, Jeff, final word as we send them out here on a big uh, big week of racing coming up. Didn't have a whole lot to talk about from last week, but I think that changes now. Um, we've got the preps, the really important prep races are going to uh, start to surface uh, every week from here on in. So we will see what happens there. And it's interesting. I, I realized that the Kentucky Derby is different without any Bob Bafferts to consider. You always had to mm-hmm. figure that maybe he's got the best ones. There are no Bafferts, which means yeah. it's wide open. You know? That's it. And um, it's, it's refreshing to a certain extent. Um, mm-hmm. But anyway, um, uh, the Derby winner literally this year could come from anywhere. So we'll be watching. Hopefully we'll have some insight from here on in. And a special thanks to the NTRA for some of the content that we were able to use on the podcast today from the National Horse Players Championship. Congrats one more time to Mike Gillum on the big $800,000 score. He's Jeff Siegel. I'm Jeremy Plunk. We'll be back on Friday with the First Call podcast when we preview eight weekend stakes races. Until then, have a great week, everybody.